Thompson, and welcome to another Escape to Gaming. Today I've got kind of a fun episode in Reflections, looking back at my time in the 80s as a gamer, just as a young person in general, kind of growing up and finally being off on my own, getting my first you know, apartment, jobs, cars, everything. It was really an exciting time. Uh, you know, many of us will look back on the 80s or the 70s, oh, I know all about that, we've seen pictures, and, you know, we know about the the rock bands and the TV shows and the movies and, and how things looked back then, but at the time, you just didn't know. We didn't know what was coming. So you went to go see a movie like Ghostbusters, you just knew you liked Bill Murray or you liked Dan Aykroyd. You really didn't know if it was going to be good or not, so it was exciting that every film you saw... Every time you heard a new, you know, song on the radio from Duran Duran or Wang Chung or Phil Collins or whatever it was, you'd never heard that song before. So this was like an exciting time to be alive. In fact, of all of the decades that I've lived through, and I've lived through five of them actually, uh, the 80s was probably my favorite. It just things, we kind of shook off the dust of the 60s and 70s with all the earth tones and a lot of the old things from the past. We're really embracing the future and Star Wars and Battlestar Galactica and computers and technology and all that. And I thought that was really one of my favorite aspects of growing up in my early 20s and living through the 80s. In fact, before I get too wrapped up in my 80s thing here, I actually found, I just discovered these, I thought these were long gone, I found all of my, actually my Vice City Grand Theft Auto CDs, which are all great soundtracks from the 80s. So I was really delighted to find all these. They're in great shape. There's not even a fingerprint on them, scratches. Are great. I don't have the original box anymore that they came in, but I was so thrilled to find these. I knew I had them somewhere, so I wanted to kind of have them to kind of showcase these with my little time in the 80s. So I have a few uh, pictures I took of these that I'm going to show while I'm talking about them. But I love the 80s. The music in the 80s, the films, the, you know, the, 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 the clothing, everything that we had at the time was really cool. And that's what I loved about the 80s. It was just a, it, we were kind of a new, fresh, all new style of cars, clothing, films, music. It was really a, a fun time to, you know, to, to, uh, to be alive, a fun time to see things develop. Finally, we were embracing what was coming, which was the future. And the 80s was almost like a, a modern version of everything we had dreamed of in the 70s. It's like we were getting it overnight. That's what I really loved about growing up in the 80s. Now, one of my first jobs was at this pizza place that my, all my friends and I would frequent often. We loved this place because we'd go and have our pizza and sodas and drinks. And then they had seven or eight really good machines. They had my favorite game, Sprint. They had Pac-Man. They, um, they had Galaxian. And they had many other games. Occasionally, they'd shift and change some of the games over time. But, I mean, I went to this place for like four or five years uh, and spent a lot of time there. Well, actually, I got to know the manager and finally get a full-time job working there, which was awesome. So then after work, depending on my shift time, I'd have my friends meet me over there, and I'd stay there for another hour and a half or two hours, and we just put a ton of quarters in the machines and game. And again, Galaxian was probably my favorite uh, machine in that place at the time. I had a friend of mine that was actually working on the Guinness Book of World Records for Pac-Man. He's one of the top Pac-Man players. His friend, uh, his friend of mine, his name was Mike Lannis, and so we'd go in there and we'd watch him just do it nonstop. The guy was like a, a, a computer with Pac-Man. So it was really exciting, you know, just watching things develop with the arcade machines. They were getting better and better. Eventually we had Centipede and even cooler, you know, games were coming out. So it was really a great time to be in the arcades. The arcades were changing. Some of them were now being incorporated with, you know, uh, water parks where they had, you know, water slides and kind of amusement park rides. And but so some of the we saw a kind of a, a transition of uh, arcades dying out from the 70s and then new fun family centers and fun parks and water parks that had these arcade machines that were coming on the scene. And it really was very exciting. So the first part of the 80s was just struggling, you know, you know trying to get your first car get into your first apartment and all that. So it was kind of a struggle, and at the time, there was kind of a malaise with gaming. The, uh, the Atari wasn't doing as well um, in the early 80s, so we had kind of that really bad period in the early 80s with games. And uh, they are almost dying out at scene. The, arcade, uh, the arcades were going strong, but the home consoles, I was kind of losing faith with Atari, with the 2600, and even the 5200, the Magnavox, I, I really wanted one really bad, but I just, I had to wait. I didn't have the money. I was kind of in that survival mode initially, trying to get, you know, my first car and all that. 
But once I got on my feet and got my own pad, and by you know 1984, finally, I had a really cool apartment, and I was saving up to get my first brand new car. And I whenever I went out and bought a little you know 20 inch Mitsubishi TV set, it was just cool to have my own pad, no one to tell me what the hell to do. I could stay up all night, watch movies, what have you. It really was a fun time. Uh, MTV just came on the scene, and it really was just a very fun and fresh time to be young. I mean, this is right when I'm you know in my early early 20s, just enjoying life. The whole future is wide open and uh, hit a lot of great films. I remember when we wanted to go see Ghostbusters, all I knew was I liked Dan Aykroyd and like Bill Murray. We didn't know if it was going to be a good film, a bad film. I didn't know if it was just a pure comedy. What? We just saw one trailer on TV. That was it. So it was really cool. All of a sudden you go and you see it actually is a great film. So it's easy to look back on things from the 80s, but at the time I lived it. We were right there. So you saw a movie like, I remember seeing The Terminator the first day it came out. I didn't know. It was like a low-budget film. We didn't know it was going to be a fantastic movie. Uh, you know, The Blade Runner was another one. These are great films that kind of catapulted us into the futuristic elements of the 80s. Not long after, we had Miami Vice, you know, in 84. And it kind of took that MTV theme of music and movies and put them into a really polished television show. And that really was one of the things that I kind of leaned towards was that really clean style that Michael Mann portrayed in Miami Vice, um, you know, and uh, frankly the, the 80s with just clean living, uh, you know, really modern architecture, glass block, lots of neon, you started seeing it cropping up everywhere, finally getting rid of all that, you know, macrame and wood grain and everything from the 70s, as cool as that was, as much as I loved it, and embracing more chrome and glass and steel and futuristic, you know, like we had seen a lot of futuristic films, so it really was kind of a great time we were wearing, you know, a lot of Italian clothes, very modern-looking clothes, and sunglasses, and listening to Duran Duran and uh, Wang Chung. I even went to see Phil Collins at his No Jacket Required, uh, you know, concert that he did outdoors. It was fantastic. I mean, it was really a great time. The, you know, we're still listening to cassettes in the first half of the '80s, and I was there, you know, and saw the transition even in, into CDs. So uh, even the interiors of the cars had kind of a computer grid style in them. Everything was kind of modern. So we saw through industrial design, interior design, gaming, everything kind of had this futuristic, very modern feel to it. And you just felt like every day, every film you saw, every TV show, everything was becoming um, you know, more clean looking, more simplified, or slowly getting rid of a lot of those... Uh, the themes and feelings of the 70s and embracing a much better attitude. America was actually more prosperous. Uh, we had a much better self, uh, uh, healthier self-image as Americans at the time. So it's just an exciting time to, to be alive. You just felt that that next person you bump into could offer you a great job or you never know, you know, you'd get that first, uh, you know, new car was really exciting. I got my first new car was an 85 Dodge Shelby Charger with a turbo charger. Everything had a turbo in it. That was a big thing. And it's kind of a computer grid, little you know, interior cockpit in it, very futuristic, a little turbo gauge in it. Everything had these kind of these little gadgets that kind of um, was indicative of this modern period that we were living in. I was hitting a lot of rock concerts too at the time. I saw you know Ozzy uh, did a wonderful concert, and I think it was '83. I saw him at the Bark at the Moon tour. Fantastic concert, Screaming for Vengeance, Judas Priest. I saw. You know, later I saw, you know, Phil Collins and some other pop bands and Ray Charles. I got to see some really great bands. Um, just, it was a fantastic time to be in your 20s. My first apartment, I didn't have a lot of furniture, but I had some really cool artwork. Uh, the things that, the, kind of the Miami Vice, for, you know, Ferraris and pictures like that on the walls. You had real modern lamps and TV sets. And we just were kind of emulating this whole futuristic feel. And the video games were a big part of that. I just, at the time, I was kind of in that survival mode. I still didn't have a home console, but we were hitting the arcades hot and heavy. But finally, it was right around the mid-80s, I think it was 85, 86, I moved down to Los Angeles. I got out of Fresno, kind of a smaller little farm town in Central California. Moved to L.A., which is this giant big city. You know, I was really excited being, you know, in the big city for the first time. And now I've got all new friends to make, new arcades to hit up, and new movies. You know, so there's great films that were coming out around the mid-80s. Still kind of watching Miami Vice on TV. And, and uh, it wasn't shortly after, you know, within about a, a year and a half of living in L.A., I had a place right down to Redondo Beach, down right down by the beach, living that dream, 
you know, new car, my own pad, and I was waiting to get my first console. So a friend of mine got this Commodore 64. I'd never seen them before. I saw a commercial on TV. I saw them at Sears. I think they were like between five and six hundred bucks at the time. I can't remember exactly what they were. I think I played, paid a little under six hundred dollars for a joystick controller and for the first Commodore system. And I think the first games even were like forty bucks a pop on these big, you know, floppy disks. They were incredibly slow operating. Uh, just made these horrendous noises when they were working. I mean, it sounded almost like a dishwashing machine, you know, to hear these things operating, but God, they were just fantastic. So my buddy had this game called Barnstormer that I just loved. Now, we had seen it on the uh, Atari 2600, and it looked cool, but this is more of an isometric, kind of a top-down, almost a slightly 3D view, looking slightly down at little barns and the river and the roads and the plane flying up and down above... Um, you know, windmills and through barns and everything. Very cool. And I saw that game and I just, based off that one game alone, I said, that's it. This is already a huge improvement over the Atari setup. This is what I want. And that was my goal, was to get my first Com Commodore 64. So I started saving like crazy and it took me close to a year to get the money to get my first Commodore. So the first night that I got my Commodore 64, the first game that I bought, I actually bought two games. I bought Paperboy and I had uh, Silent Service with the first two games I bought. I think it was right around 87, late 86, 87 in there somewhere. And man, they were really cool. I stayed up all night long. I bet I played eight or nine hours straight of Silent Service. It's really cool submarine simulation. I'll never forget the cheesy you know, <laughs> Commodore music that they had that went with it. And just the immersion of it was fantastic. And then I would kind of switch off and enjoy the fun of Paperboy, which is quite challenging. The controls, looking back on it, were really god-awful and awkward, but I loved the game. Not long after that, I got another game called MIG Alley, which I loved. Very simplistic. Kind of these Korean War jets flying. and It just, you basically had, you know, sky and ground, that's it, with a horizon line. You know, there's no trees, you really couldn't see any detail. But you felt like you were flying, you know, over Korea at high altitudes or low down over the water or whatever it was. Tremendous amount of fun. I had another game I really liked. Not, I think it was like the fourth game I got was Spy vs. Spy, The Island Caper, which I always loved. Mad Magazine and Spy vs. Spy. I loved this game. I was obsessed with playing it and just had a lot of fun playing it and replaying it. And there are many other games. Your first test drive game on the Commodore 64 was fantastic. I mean, I really, for the first time, felt like I was playing a driving game where you could see the cockpit of the car. I had never seen that before. It was a dream come true for a car enthusiast. At the time, I started, you know, buying more hot rods and old, you know, 69 Dodge Chargers and 1970 Dodge Challengers. Cars today, which are at Barrett Jackson for, you know, big money. But at the time, these were affordable muscle cars that, you know, back in the 80s, you could buy and, and hot rod and do burnouts with and have a great time. So I was spending a lot of money on my cars and spending every extra <laughs> amount of dough I had on these Commodore 64 games. Quite often, I could only afford one or two a week, but I would put every dollar I had into these games. I think I had like 110 Commodore 64 games. You know, 40 bucks a pop, that was, you know, be like close to $120 a game today. It was a lot of money, but I was just loved the games. I eventually got Gunship, I got F-15 Strike Eagle. One of my favorites was a game that was called Dive Bomber. I absolutely loved that game. Uh, Pirates, Sid Meier's Pirates, a fantastic game, which I played on a couple different consoles and platforms. I loved that game very, very much on that C64. It really was a wonderful time to be a gamer. I had another Formula One game. Uh, that I absolutely loved, which actually was the first game that actually had real Formula One tracks at, you know, Monaco and Brands Hatch and all these tracks. You had a little joystick, would wear these joysticks out. You know, they were very expensive at $40 a pop back then. And I, I, God, I bet I blew through probably seven or eight of those you know, joysticks wearing them out. They'd be kind of sore in your hands. This was kind of a, not a very um, ergonomically <laughs> comfortable thing to hold in your hand and operate. But a lot of fun. I just can't tell you how much fun that C64 machine was. I would have friends who would come over and pull all-nighters, taking turns, and you th you'd think you were playing the most immersive game on the current gen console. It really was that fun. So even people look back, and all those games are really crappy and cheesy, but to, to us, that was cutting-edge technology. It was the best. 
PCs back in the 80s, mid to late 80s, were well over five grand. They'd be like paying over 12,000 for a PC today. So PC gaming was very expensive. It really wasn't until the 90s where you saw the prices radically drop down on those to where they were affordable. And I had to wait, unfortunately, until the 90s before getting one because I had a buddy of mine that he had the big bucks and he had a brand new PC and he had the more advanced flight simulators and things. And God, I spent a tremendous amount of time. He lived in Fresno. I'd drive up and see him and spend the whole weekend. And we just take turns playing these flight simulator games on PC. So I had a real taste for the PC games early on. But I liked my Commodore because it really was like a console. You hooked it up to the TV through a little wire and it put out the, the cheesy sound right out of the unit itself. Um, and it really was just a, it was a fun system to collect games on and to play. And you could pick it up and pretty much take it with you if you're traveling, put it back in the box and styrofoam. We'd bring that with me back to Fresno for my friends and plug it in. And then we'd play as PC games and take turns playing that, playing our favorite, you know, arcade games on the C64. So these were wonderful times. And a little later on in the 80s, I started, you know, augmenting my collection with more games. By this time, you know, great movies like, you know, Predator came out which were fantastic. Some of these late, uh, you know, uh, movies like Lethal Weapon and great, you know, uh, movies that were coming out in the late 80s were really cool. So, you know, I had a couple more cool apartments and cars and transitionary time. So it was just a wonderful time. I'll never forget that. Many of us will kind of look back and remember where we were, you know, playing games at, either at home or when we had our first apartment. These are very fond memories for me. You know, again, uh, the, the NES didn't really come till the very late 80s, and I had one friend that had it, and I loved the Duck Hunt and loved playing some of the very early, you know, Donkey Kong and Mario Brothers games on that uh, NES system. But I still was really obsessed with the simulations and some of the fun games, like Paperboy and uh, Skate or Die was another one I really loved. I just had a lot of fun. I used to skateboard, and I love Skate or Die, as cheesy as it is looking back on it now. So. Uh, to me, that was my console growing up. That was my most proud thing that I bought in the 80s. Uh, next to my car, of course, was my Commodore 64. I I'll never forget that. And I eventually gave it to one of my best friends, which he just was eternally grateful. Plus, he got all the games for free. He was just delighted. And he played them for like another three or four years after that before he finally got, and we actually both did later in the very early 90s, I finally broke down and got that Super NES. But the 80s were closing at this point. It, we really just love the concerts. We love the music. I love the decor in the homes, the styling, the clothing. Um, you know, just having you know girlfriends and the romancing at the time was a lot of fun. Uh, it just was a great time to be alive. Just a lot of exciting things. The movies were you know very exciting. I mean, we look back today. We got a great you know game coming out like this far. Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon that looks fantastic and kind of is kind of a fun mockery of a lot of those fun elements from you know the you know television Saturday morning cartoons back in the 80s and uh, you know the old VCRs and all of that. Well, that was a big part of it. You know, we you know VCR. My first VCR was got $1,250 in the early 80s. Took me a long time to save up for that sucker too. So. Um, you know, I, my, my life centered a lot of it around my little you know 20 inch TV and, you know, my VCR and that Commodore 64. That was a very special central hub of my home for th throughout the whole 80s. I'll, I'll never forget. So I was kind of slowly near the end of the 80s, kind of leaving the arcades and spending more time gaming at home. And I was very curious to see what the 90s were going to bring in the way of gaming, fun, and films. And that'll be coming up next in my time in the 90s. So I hope that you found this was fun, something I've been wanting to do for a while. It meant so much to me to be part of that whole scene growing up in the 80s. Uh, it was one of my more fonder memories looking back, and I wanted to share it with you. So I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your support. I really do appreciate it, and enjoy your games, guys.